Hey there, I'm Annie Dickerson. And I'm Susan Elliott. And today's episode of the Life and Money Show, we are going to look at financial wellness and financial self-care in a new light. Because we talk a lot in this day and age about taking care of our bodies, exercising, eating right, getting the smoothies, getting kale into your kids, (laughs) something I think a lot about. But what we don't talk about is the kind of things that we need to do to maintain a higher level of financial wellness. We're talking health here, but as it relates to finances, and we're going to give you a blueprint, a very concrete step-by-step process to be able to check in on your financial wellness regularly and maintain the level of health here that allows you to live a life by design. So stick around for that. And here's the thing, financial wellness, just like your own social, emotional, physical wellness, isn't a one and done. You need people around you to keep you accountable, to help support you along the way, to help you overcome challenges that come along. And so we have created a great community of people who are all for financial wellness, who are building their own wealth through investing in real estate and living a life by design. And that's called the Good Egg Investor Club. And if you're listening to this, you are invited to join. It's completely free and you'll get connected with our team and our community of investors. So to join, just go to goodegginvestments.com slash invest. All right. With that, Susan, where do we want to kick it off with financial wellness? You know, Annie, I want to hear when have you felt financially unwell in your life? Mm. Like financial, a little bit of financial disease, a little bit of financial sickness in your life. Tell us a story about how that's felt for you. You know, there have been so many little moments in my life. I mean, you know, long time, if you're a long time listener, you know that I grew up with two parents with very different beliefs about money. My mom was a saver. My dad was always a gambler. So it was a very different viewpoint on money and spending and what you should spend it for. And um, a lot of stories come to mind, but the one that I'm going to tell, this seems kind of silly, but just bear with me. This was early on um, after we started um, Good Egg Investments. And Julie and I, um, we regularly went to Las Vegas, actually, because our our one of our business coaches was there. And so when we would go to Vegas, we would stay at this, um, this hotel right by the airport. And so one of the first times we went, I remember, I get in, I do my normal thing, I fly into the airport, and then I I know that I have researched it ahead of time. I knew that the hotel had a free shuttle, so I'm standing there waiting for the free shuttle, and um, then I get to the, the um, hotel room later than Julie does, of course. She has taken an Uber. And we get there and she's drinking one of the the bottles of water from the from the hotel room that you have to pay for. And so just those two things, I'm like, oh my gosh, there was a free option. I I waited around, I took the free, I've got tap water in my water bottle. And then I'm like, wait a second. Wait a second. Why would I do I think I'm not worthy? of a like a five dollar uber ride and a you know a two three four dollar bottle of water why do i think i need to wait for the free shuttle and then i'm not worthy of that i have to go and fill my water with the tap water and so in that moment i as much as i wanted to be like julie why didn't you take the free shuttle and why did you pay for that bottle of water i was like wait a second is there's a different way to look at this. And I'm like l- looking at my own habits and really thinking about why do I think I'm not worthy here? And that clued me in mm. to one piece where I was maybe not at that level of financial wellness that I wanted to be at. Or that you knew was there, that you had a, you, you saw it in front of you. Like you're like, Julie right. clearly right. doesn't stress out about a bottle of water right now. Yeah. <laughs> and how come that's causing me stress? And it was the financial piece of that bottle of water that was causing you stress. And so you had this moment where you saw that stress happen 
or you saw the the thing and then and then the reality check came in of like uh Annie that's a $2 bottle of water like you yep. deserve <laughs> that i've had so many of those Annie i'm so glad you brought that up and i love asking you these questions because i do feel like i've heard all of your great financial stories until i'm like no no Annie i want you to tell me a different <laughs> one not the one about being you know having the apartment mm-hmm. that was flooding not the other one not the other one right? tell me another one. So, i think it's like a, an element of like welcoming money into our lives in a regular day to day thing. I think I've felt the most unwell in the type periods of my life where I've like shoved money to the side and been like, okay, I'm just going to take care of my bills and we're just going to set everything up. Then I'm just going to forget about it because I don't want to deal with it. It's like, that's as if you're taking your whole bottle of vitamins right at the same time. Right. <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> yes. Right. And I, I think when I can bring money into the conversation where I am welcoming it into this, like, how does it make me feel how does it um, turn into stress in my life, as you just demonstrated? It 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 allows that money to be in a, the conversation along with my wellness. And mm-hmm. I think that's how I start to think about financial wellness. But what is financial yeah. wellness to you then? I mean, what what would you think about having to be able to tell somebody, you know, what does it feel like to have financial wellness? If you've ever kind of reached that wave, as you said, it's mm-hmm. never just an end spot. It's, there's never a destination of being financially well, just like you're never financially fit. And then just like, all right, I'm done. Good, good yep. check. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you know, that's what I was thinking of, because I think people are more familiar with that level of physical wellness and fitness. And, you know, here's another a, a background story you may not know about me. I grew up as a fat kid. So oh. I, yeah, you didn't know yeah, this about me. That's yeah. Tough. yeah. No, I was very, um, I was not very nutritionally minded. My mom was very, the one who is the saver. She's also a very permissive style parent. And so as we started to get some more money in with my dad's income, she would just buy all these snacks, just eat, eat, eat. No, no, don't worry about it. And all of a sudden, you know, by age seven, eight, nine, I blew up like a balloon. I didn't know. I didn't know what it was from. I mean, and your mom probably didn't no, either. She right. was like, I'm treating Yay. my daughter. These are special right. things. And yeah. 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 I used to come home from school. I would eat half a box every day, half a box of fudge covered Oreos every oh my single God. day. Dreams. It was Dreams heaven. are coming true. My daughter oh. would just <laughs> be in, she'd like do snow oh. angels in a pile of Oreos <laughs> if I could give her permission to do that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You would have to buy her bigger size clothes. I will tell you that because mm. that's what okay. happened to me. And so I, all through, you know, adolescence, young adulthood, even, you know, I have remnants of it now, you know, just this fraught relationship with my physical fitness because and nutrition, because it wasn't until my, probably my late twenties, early 30s that I really connected the dots around sugar and nutrition and physical wellness. And it was a as as simple as it sounds now, it was a complete light bulb moment for me. And so I changed the way that I ate and I changed the way that I exercised. And you know, exercise has come and gone. I know you have a great regimen and you love um, exercise. And I do now, sort of, I kind of, I've grown to love it now. Um, but, you know, uh, about a year ago, I, um, I had fallen off the, uh, the exercise wagon, so to speak, and up until about a year ago. And mm. so for about a year prior, wasn't really taking care of my body. But, you know, I, I, I'd step on the scale and I'd be like, you know, that's a decent number. I feel fine. I look yeah. okay. My clothes still fit. But that's the thing. And here's the thing with financial wellness as well is it's not about the amount of money you have in the bank. And for mm-hmm. me, it wasn't necessarily about the number on the scale. I didn't feel good about my body. And mm-hmm. it's the same with financial wellness is it doesn't matter. There are people with millions, even billions of dollars in their accounts, mm-hmm. in their net worth 
where and they, they don't never feel, feel like they have enough. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. never feel They're like constantly they have enough. So that's, feeling uneasy. Yeah. Yes. So to me, wellness is really that relationship between you and your, in this case, your financial wellness, your, your relationship between you and your money and how you feel about it and how it impacts your life. Because I know times in my life when I had very little in the bank account, but I felt really good about my money and where I was at and where I was going. So to me, that's kind of wellness in a nutshell. I like the phrase that it's it's a state of well-being that's achieved when you know what you have. You know where every all the money is at, how it's moving, how it's flowing in and out of your life. You know where you're headed. So you have this kind of idea of um, you know, your long-term plans, your long-term vision, and you're taking the steps regularly, those preventative steps of, yes, keeping my financial wellness moving, the gears turning. And the ultimate part is that you feel good about it. So it, it, it there's a the feeling element, I think, is what we neglect typically when we talk about finances. You look at your numbers, you make a plan, you set the plan, you do the plan, and then you, you're you done. And if you <laughs> don't integrate those feelings part of it, you could just be going off on someone else's plan or you could stop taking steps towards your plan because you're ignoring how it makes you feel. Yeah, I think that's so wise is that it's really, I mean... You can make a financial plan, you can check off all the boxes, you can go work with a financial planner, but at the end of the day, you might be going through all those things, but you feel so anxious, or you're so unsure, or you're just hiding from all the problems, and it that that creates a level of financial distress. And so that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to bring awareness to and bring out in the open so that we can have a conversation about it and more importantly, get you to a point where you can start to assess your own level of financial wellness. Because Susan, as you mentioned, it is a roller, this life yeah. is a roller coaster yeah. ride. There's never a, we're just talking about uh, this, there's never a single thing in life where you can check it off and be like, well, I'm done with that thing. I don't have to learn yep. any more about that. I don't have to All worry good. about that for the rest of my life. Nothing. <laughs> Just before we hit record, we're like, how are you doing? How are you doing? And I'm like, well, so far, all the childcare I have planned is yeah. happening. <laughs> So that's yeah. good. We're here. Here we are on a Monday <laughs> recording this. And I'm like, I don't know. It's the plan we're going no one's sick that's amazing yeah. so yeah you just never know what kind of things are going to happen along the way and how you have to reassess and move and change your plan um mm -hmm. absolutely and finances shouldn't you know, be any different that makes me think because we were talking about the wellness of our kids and how when kids get sick it's like you know you have all these plans for your week and you're like, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to check this off my list. I'm going to run this errand, talk to this person, make this appointment. And then a kid gets sick and it just, you cannot, like so much wah, just wah, has to go <laughs> to the side and you have to focus, you have to recalibrate you your whole week. Yeah. And I think it's it's in some ways kind of a, a an analogy for financial wellness because if you're not feeling good about your money, how mm -hmm. can you focus on building wealth? Because those are the, like, when things are, you've got that stable foundation, then you can focus on building wealth. But mm -hmm. when things are going well below the surface, you've got to push things aside. And you got to focus on that first to build mm -hmm. that foundation so that you can then go and achieve your goals. Yeah. I'm going through a very deep period of that too, where I've realized that like, there's there's some deep money beliefs and money habits that I've come across in the last just year, I would say, that are totally different than the ones that kind of I refer to as my big like financial breakdown that happened in around 2018, 2019, that sent me to real estate investing in the first place. I'm like, I need to kind of fast track my ability to invest for my family. And I let that led me to real estate. I had been doing a little bit of stock market. But these days, there's something that like I'm still releasing with it so that I can kind of show up as my my true and full self. And it's an interesting like being able to look at like how I'm still a little financially unwell in different corners of my psyche and be able to like dig deeper into that and 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 use that to inform the next action. So that makes me think of like how we can help you the listener to be able to understand 
where these levels, where these little kind of corners of financial unwellness are in your life. Because maybe you're the kind of person that is starting to invest your money. Maybe you have a good job and you've got income. Maybe you're doing kind of automatic transfers into your investing account and you're making those investments every year and you're sort of like, but something doesn't feel totally well to me in that department. So Annie, let's talk a little bit about some flags that are like, what does financial unwellness look like? I think that this will really help the listener. Yeah. So unwellness, I mean, we hit on one of them, um, which was, you know, this kind of incongruity. Is that a word? Incongruousness? (laughs) Incongruency. There we go. I like that. Now we've turned this into a grammar podcast. Um, That incongruity between congruence. I said uh, incongruence. Okay. This incongruence between the amount of money you have in your bank account and how you feel about it. So for example, having a lot of money or whatever you think a lot of money is in the bank, but feeling really insecure about it. And I I can tell you, I'm the first one. My husband has felt this way. I have felt this way. And we look at their bank account and we're like, we have more money now than we did back in our 20s for sure. But why are we yeah. feeling this way? Why are we feeling insecure? Yeah. And so that's a big clue that maybe something is a little bit misaligned. And I would say one way to do that is, like you said, compare yourself to your, your, yourself in your 20s. That's a great big flag. Like, and, and that's a great way to just say, like, oh, I'm doing pretty well. I'm actually, like, taking care of my financial wellness to some degree. So give yourself a little credit for that, typically. And, and maybe you're not. Maybe you're in more debt than you were then, and that's okay, too. But to be able to also say, like, oh, I have – plenty in my emergency savings fund to live off of for the next five or six months. Like that's a huge win in this. And, and a way to say like, to check yourself with that scarcity, because the word scarcity is like, well, I don't know if I'm feeling scarce or not. Well, if you, if you can look at a number and say like, well, actually we'd be fine for six months. Can I change this ship around in six months? Well, probably I can do some pretty big things to move the ship around. So we're, we're kind of fine. And that's a way to check that scarcity um, mindset in you a little bit. I would say not yeah. also also not having a clear plan for your money is an element of financial unwellness. So if if you don't really know, like if you had an extra ten thousand dollars right now to invest, what you would do with it to fit into your diversified investing plan, um, then that might be a good sign that you need to have a little bit more structure inside your plan, or you might be a little bit financially unwell in terms of planning, not having a plan at all, or like not um, knowing where that plan is going to take you. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, not having a plan for the money is just, it's kind of like money comes in and you're just like, I don't, I don't want to think about it right now. I don't know. I don't want to think about it. And it creates it unknowingly or unknowingly, it creates this burden and this guilt and this shame Um, that you may be harboring on the surface or under the surface that you're just, you don't feel good about where your money is going and what it's doing for you. And so that's really where the clear plan comes along. And even if the clear plan is, I'm going to put this money into my savings account so it earns a little bit of interest. And then after it reaches a certain amount, then I'm going to start to invest. That's great. As long as you Mm -hmm. have a a plan um, and then that way you can feel good about that money sitting there or going towards something. Um, I would add to that, oh, this is a big one. Feeling guilty whenever you spend money. Oh my goodness. I have to check. This is every time, especially every time you spend money. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Yeah. And And you mentioned guilt and shame around money. That's those are just huge flags that like something's not right here. Um, Yeah. And I remember earlier on and sometimes still you know, like I said, it bounces back and forth. It's never at all and done, one and done. Um, I used to, I remember I would feel so good about spending money on other people. Mm. And I would feel so guilty when I spent it on myself. The littlest mm. things, like I would ch- choose the cheapest thing for myself and choose the best version for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is not just a financial wellness. There's more going on there, but financial wellness is certainly a piece of the puzzle there as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Um, Another one is questioning whether you have enough. And I want to give you this quote by Lisa Peterson in her book, The Mindful Millionaire, for this one, because the, the idea of like, do I have enough is, again, that's like a really hard concept, just like scarcity. It's a hard concept to like put concrete thoughts around. My analytical brain wants to like define that in clear terms um, or just be able to relate it back to me. What does enough mean to me? What does scarcity mean to me? So she says, scarcity causes people to become myopic and single-mindedly focused on problems at hand rather than seeking to find helpful solutions. So you're, you're seeing the problems. That's a good flag to say, do, is this enough? Am I feeling scarce in my life um, with around finances? But once you, once you focus, once our focus, she says, becomes tunneled in like this, you become less likely to consider all of your options. That's the abundance, mm. right? We're focusing on the scarcity of not having enough. We're not focused broadly on what is there, what is in front of us, what could be. Um, and I, I like that she kind of put those concrete words around what it means to have enough, what it means to feel scarce. Like we said, we can look at our big bank accounts and say, we still don't have enough. There's billionaires who never feel like they have enough. And so to be able to define what is enough for you and, and start to think about how the world is abundant around us instead of scarce. Again, that's not just looking at the problems. It's looking at the solutions and other opportunities around us. Yeah. And so just tying that into physical wellness too is another framework. You know, it reminds me of the times growing up that I, t- my, my myopic vision was focused on just the number on the scale. Mm-hmm. And that was my, you know, my scarcity mindset in that that was the one problem that I was focused on rather than thinking about all the possible ways to become a more healthier version of me. I was just focused on getting that number down, getting that number down. And um, I think it precluded me from a lot of healthier choices that I could have made uh, mm-hmm. along the way. So I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. How about um, feeling stressed because you don't understand your investments? That's a form of financial mm-hmm. unwellness. We, we mm-hmm. often like outsource that to a financial advisor or a partner or someone to just deal right with the investing yeah. piece. Is it, yeah. Because that world has not been traditionally sort of open and education first, mm-hmm. we'll call it. And uh, especially yep. if you're a, a person of color or race or a female or anyone outside of the traditional, what we would think of as, you know, who, he who handles all the finances, you know, it's not been easy to understand that. Um, so if if you feel stressed because that world feels closed off to you, then find a world like Good Egg Investments who leads with education and just wants to really uplift the level that people understand about their finances and their investing. But um, that stress is a good flag that you have a little bit of financial unwellness in your life. Absolutely. And related to that, not having a clear picture of your overall finances or not having a plan for your future or for retirement, um, any of that you know, that ambiguity or the fuzziness around what, where you currently are or where you're trying to go. Um, it, it could, doesn't always, but it could lead to you feeling bad, feeling guilty. Again, the, those emotions, those tough emotions coming in, and that's what clouds your relationship with your money and leads to that financial unwellness. I was going to say, I'll tell you a quick story about um, the plan for your future retirement, because I think that this Mm -hmm. kind of highlights that it can be more of a systemic thing in in a community or a phase of life that you're in. So in my 20s, I was a professional whitewater kayak instructor, river guide. I did some teaching and some writing and all kinds of little things along the side. But I was surrounded in a community of people that just didn't make a a ton of money. And so the words retirement or plan for retirement were not part of our vocabulary. It, it's not as if there was something else, but I think we all, all just defaulted to like, well, we're just going to have to work until we die. Like, I don't know. And by being a part of this surrounded community that had that shared language of, of not, you know, not valuing making a lot of money, not being sort of financially well off because it just wasn't as easy to do that in this profession or this career, or this line of work. Um, it was totally possible. And I now believe that 
everyone, when they become wealthy, just becomes a better person or a better version of themselves, we'll call it. So there's a lot of people out there who would do real, amazing things for the world if they could just kind of get out of this financial scarcity or this insecure financial place that they're in. And I know that that's where I was too. But I think that's a good trigger if like, I, I'm never going to retire. I can't do that. If it's just, if you just kind of close a door off or maybe like I can't invest in real estate, you're closing something off without actually doing the due diligence to see if that is. And I mean, that, I think that's a form of financial unwellness as well. Um, a form of not having your plan or retirement or considering those options. You're tunneled in again. And so maybe you need to expand it a little bit to be able to feel financial wellness. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you bring up such a good point that sometimes it's as easy as finding one other person who may think a little bit differently, who can get you out of that myopic vision, that tunnel vision, and get you to think a little bit differently, even if it's something that might not, even if what they're doing might not work exactly for you, but it expands your viewpoint and gets you to mm -hmm. think, huh wonder what else is out there. Even listening mm -hmm. to this podcast is a version of you expanding your mindset and seeing what else is out there. Absolutely. It's the it's one of the things that helped me get out of that place. I mean, this podcast literally back in 2019 or 2020 when you launched it with with uh, with Julie, it was one of the many podcasts, but this one especially because I had just had my first child and I was like, oh, they're moms too. Like, oh, mom life, thank you so much <laughs> for highlighting the uh, everything that goes into that too. So, and, and connecting it to our financial wellness. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, let's jump well, into helping the listener get some really concrete steps. So the yeah. Life and Money Show Financial Wellness Blueprint. Kick it off, Annie. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. Well, first I'll say that this doesn't necessarily have to, there are five steps to this financial wellness blueprint, and this does not have to be done in order. And it's not meant to be done one time and then you put it away. It's kind of like a give and take. You kind of have these five pieces and you're assessing and you're constantly reflecting on these different areas. And each of them gives you a clue into your overall financial wellness. And they'll change throughout the various phases of your life as you invest, as you have kids, as your kids go away to college, as you're buying a home, as you're traveling, all these things may change. And so it's a good framework, a good blueprint to revisit um, time and again. So, um, all right, I mentioned there are five pieces. So I'll start with the first one, um, which is very simple, is just to define what financial wellness means to you. And we've talked about it a lot between me and Susan, but for you, financial wellness might be something different. Maybe it's a feeling or maybe it's a number in your bank account. Maybe it's having a steady stream of income or maybe it's having a certain investment portfolio size or whatever it is, but pinpoint what that target is and then figure out what the gap is between where you are and that vision of financial wellness. And this is where it could come in again and again because your vision of financial wellness today might be different from what it was, let's say back in your 20s or what it will be 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So it's good to continually reflect on what financial wellness might be. And be sure to not just give yourself one number here. Don't make financial wellness a single number, whether that's what you want to make this year, what you want to invest, have invested for retirement. Also talk about like how you want money to feel every day in your life. Because if we only kind of push money to this like analytical place, this technical place of like future planning, of retirement planning, then we never give it its, its sort of like daily emotional support the preventative financial wellness maintenance that you might you might need every day. So like how do you want to feel about spending your money? That's a great one. How do I want to feel about when I go on vacation? You know, you're anytime you're spending money, you can determine how you want to feel about that. That's great. Mm -hmm. So number two is figuring out the big rocks in your way. Figure out what stresses you the most around money and 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 think about like what are immediate solutions that you could do to alleviate that? Maybe just immediate actions for longer term solutions you could take. But these big rocks are are really kind of like probably what you, you see and you just turn around and walk the other way when it comes to financial wellness. But like, let's take a look at them. 
Yeah. And it's so important to start with the big things first, because you're going to have the most energy to put towards that. And yeah, they might be the scariest, but they'll also probably make the biggest difference. And so that's Mm -hmm. why you want to start with those biggest things first. Maybe it's investing in your first real estate property, or maybe it's moving your your money to a different type of account, or maybe it's starting a new type of account to save towards something. Um, but figuring out what that biggest thing is, and then working towards that, because that's going to give you the greatest sense of, okay, I'm really on this path. I'm really making progress toward financial wellness, and then everything else will be much easier. <sighs> All right. So then um, the third thing uh, in the financial wellness blueprint, after you know what financial wellness means to you and you've figured out and tackled a few of the big rocks in your way, then the next thing is to get really familiar with your money. So often the fears around money come from not knowing where your money is or not knowing where it's coming from, where it's going out, when the bills are due, what's what's what. And so this next step is really about cozying up with your money and getting really in there and figuring out, okay, I've got this pile of money here, this pile there. Oh, I forgot. I have this old retirement account here. Okay. Let me move that over here. And okay. What about my spouses? Okay. They've got this account here, this account there. Uh, What about insurance? What does that look like? What about taxes? And so really getting familiar with all the different things that touch your money, not just the amount in your bank account, but all that having that holistic look at um, your money. Um, and so Leslie Batson, actually, she was a previous uh, guest on this podcast. She talks a lot about um, all the different pieces of your financial picture, not just what's in your bank account. So if you haven't already, go back and listen to that because um, she really dives into a lot of different pieces there. But what this can really help you do is it helps you to feel more. If you know where you are, then At the very least, you know where you stand. And so that can make you help you to feel more financially secure. It gives you so much power. It gives you like the the agency to know that like I I know where it all is right now and I can actually take steps now to move it, to improve it, to do something with it. But when we leave it in the shadows and we don't think about it, and I'm speaking from experience, (laughs) then then we, uh, we have no hope to be able to change it. You're just kind of like putting, shuffling it under the rug. So bring it out from under the rug. I think step number four is to create short-term and long-term goals. So as you gain confidence about how your money's coming in, where it's going out, think about some short-term goals. Maybe these are month monthly goals. Maybe it's within the, the next year that you can do to help yourself feel a little bit better about your finances, to uplift that financial wellness status. And so go back to what you want to feel about your emotions and what you want to, you know, if maybe it's you don't want to feel guilty around spending every dollar. Well, if you know how much is coming in and how much is going out, maybe you can say, you know what, this is my budget for my self-care every month. And I am going to feel great about spending that money because I know I have it coming in and I know we're taking care of ourselves. So you're you're going back to those feelings and you're actually making the short-term plan to uplift them, to feel better about your finances. Also take long-term action because long-term um, or, or create long-term goals, I should say. And then you're taking the small steps to get towards those goals because financial wellness is this long-term journey. Um, we do want to be working towards retirement. We're going to have to take care of ourselves as we age uh, some way or another. And taking those steps now can really uplift the way you feel now. Mm-hmm. And I would say that, you know, don't forget that those goals don't have to be completely money related. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to go and invest. You have to go and move your money or do this with your money. It can be related to education. It can be related to connection. Go to one, let's say a real estate, local real estate investing meetup and meet one other person who's doing something that you want to do or listen to 
you know, two to three podcast episodes a week on money mindset or whatever it is. So, you know, those can be related to your short term goals too. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, directly money related um, to contribute to your financial wellness. And finally, um, so we've got, we've already, we've got your meaning of financial wellness. We've got the big rocks identified and tackled. Now you're familiar with your money and you've got some short-term and long-term goals. So now you should be feeling pretty good about your money. So the final piece is to give yourself permission to do something with your money that feels good. And do not what would skip you do this one. right now, Annie? If I, you had a hundred dollars to spend oh, on yourself right now, what would you do? My goodness, what would you? Do? I would take myself on a date right now. I would cancel all my afternoon meetings. I would go get myself a nice cup of coffee. I would get myself some flowers, and I would just, you know, I would, you know, I would spend some time. I, I don't necessarily even know if I need the full hundred dollars, but I would go and spend the afternoon with myself and just really feel good. Feel the sunshine and feel that time by myself, with myself. What about you, Susan? What would you do? I would go to the, there's this place called the Society Hotel up here in the Northwest and they have, um, it's basically a spa with hot tubs and sauna Ooh. and I would spend an hour there and then I would just spend another hour just like in my, the bathrobe, sipping tea and writing in my journal and reading just like you. It's a time oh. thing. And so ask yes. this question to yourself, yes. listener, right now. What would mm -hmm. you do with if someone gave you $100 right now? And the, the, your answers to that question are going to help you determine how it is you want to feel about money, what you want to be doing with your time. Did you notice how Annie was like, I, don't, I may not even use the full $100 here. I actually just want some little time slivers to myself to slow down and do these things. So maybe that allows Annie to say, you know what, I'm not going to feel guilty about spending X amount of money on just going to the coffee shops once a week, going to, you know, get my nails done to show up a little bit more brighter in my meetings this week. And, um, you know, these kinds of questions are really fun ways to throw out to give yourself permission to do something with your money that feels good to just even know what that is for you. Yeah. And that's so, that's such a great point is just to know what it is, even if you're not going to go do it right now, but to know what that is to make you feel better, good about yourself. And maybe it's not even something for you. Maybe it's like you want to go and give, you want to buy something for somebody else or take somebody else to have an experience. Um, but I think that's key is to have that in mind to know, oh, that would make me feel really good. And that then feeds back into into this cycle of financial wellness because then it gives you that motivation to say, oh, you know what? I really do want to feel good about my money because when I do, I can treat myself to things like this and then I'll feel really good. And that's what it's all about. It's not about mm -hmm. the money. It's about the relationship and then being able to do these things for yourself that make you feel good. Life is about feeling good. <laughs> Not yeah. amassing billions and billions and billions of dollars, as it turns out. I know. It's about feeling good. Yeah. And that comes with its own, I mean, amassing billions and billions of dollars comes with its own burdens. I mean, people think money is the be all and end all. But, you know, I was just listening to, uh, a, not to take us off on a tangent before we wrap, we're almost done. But I was listening to a podcast um, where this this young entrepreneur, she started a company at 21, sold it by 26, and had hundreds of millions of dollars within a five-year period, hundreds of millions of dollars. And so then the host actually asked her, well, you know, does that impact your relationships now? Your new friend, she's a single mom. And, you know, does that impact your relationships and your friendships? Because people might, you know, people might just want to come into your life for your money. And she said, absolutely. And so it's not like if you have this high dollar amount in your bank account, it solves all your problems. It just brings on new problems. And each of us in this life are here for different learnings and we're on a different path. So we're not here to compare. We're here to help all of us to elevate and to reach that financial, uh, that level of financial wellness where you can feel really good. So that's our hope for you. And we're so grateful that you joined us for this conversation. Su Susan, any last words before we wrap? 
I would just say like this is a community thing and this podcast was a rock for me in the early days. I'm so happy to be here. Please share with us to go over to Instagram, share with us what it feels like to have a financial win. What does financial wellness mean to you? We would love to hear from you. We will give you a shout out on the podcast um, sometimes. So go over to at Good Egg Investments and share your story. Tag us in it. Um, and we'd love to hear what other people are doing to uplift their financial wellness. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Life and Money Show. And remember that your financial journey is a lifelong adventure and we're here with you every step of the way. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time. <laughs>